everybody, and welcome to Resistance Recovery. I am more than excited to have this week's guest. It's J.F. Martell, who many of you probably know from his stellar podcast, Weird Studies, which probably is my favorite podcast. Um, him and his partner, Phil Ford, they really, they got the little je ne sais quoi going on. <laughs> And if, you're, if you haven't listened to it and you like things weird, the episode I would have you start out on is they do this episode on Shirley Jackson, the horror writer that is just hit it out of the park. Really just fantastic. So with that, um, also JF is a scholar. He's written quite a bit. Um, most notably a book called Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice but I think you've written for quite a few articles for everything from Reality Sandwich to some scholarly journals and... Yeah, yeah. a little bit. I, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a prolific writer. Um, it takes me a long time to write, um, but I, I write whenever, you know, the inspiration strikes and I try to... I try, I'm trying to write more, but yes, I have written... Uh, Quite a few essays and things like that yeah and when people ask you what you do what do you how do you answer <laughs> <clears throat> it's hard to answer because i i make a living as um well now it's changing see i'm now i could say i'm a podcaster um i'm a basically i'm a filmmaker i, I work in <clears throat> the canadian television industry and i do i make documentaries <clears throat> excuse me for television um and uh, a lot of those documentaries touch on cultural topics or, uh, sometimes a little bit on religion on a uh, little bit on you know traditional practices such as uh, i worked on a show called skin indigenous about indigenous tattooing around the world that sort of thing oh, wow. so i try to align what i do there with my my interests uh, well, the interests that I discuss on weird studies and in, in my, my writing, but to me, the two careers have always felt a little bit at odds with each other. Um, and, uh, and I, I, and, and also I consider myself a writer. So I've written a lot of screenplays and, and I've written a little bit of fiction. Um, but it was the nonfiction that took off for me. So that's what, you know, in, 2007, I think I published something on Reality Sandwich, and a lot of good came of that. I made a lot of connections and opportunities came from it. It was a little piece on Stanley Kubrick, mm. and then that led to you know the opportunity to write uh, Reclaiming Art, and then met Phil Ford, started the podcast. So I'm a bit, I consider myself a little bit of a, I guess I guess you'd say like something like a little dilettante. <laughs> I've been kind of just <laughs> dipping my toe in many different things and trying out different stuff, things man. for decades yeah yeah i'm not uh i'm not a specialist that's for sure of anything well so. it's interesting because i i had a look at your um your website before earlier today and i saw that your your academic background is in history yeah so you you some at some point made a jump from history to film and yeah. just listening to you i know that i can tell you're really well versed in uh, aesthetic theory and philosophy of art and that kind of thing. So I was actually surprised that it was history. Yeah, well, so was I. Um, <laughs> I chose history. I wanted to do philosophy, but I was in I was in this stage I, when I was 18, 17 or whatever, and I was choosing my, you know, post high school path uh, where I really thought that getting a firm grounding in history was important. So I thought, well, I want to make films. I was also a musician. I was doing music at the time, uh, but I, I just, I couldn't see how I could not benefit personally from a good sense of history. Um, and I think that was the right call, even though it wasn't my favorite topic by any means. I think it was the right call. And, it, and then I tried to put in as much you know, I tried to study, take as many philosophy classes as I could as an undergraduate. Then I ended up going to you know, the University of Toronto wanting to do um, some kind of 
graduate degree in philosophy, but I didn't have the credits for it. So I was working on accumulating those. And then the, then I started making short films and left university. And then, you know, I just yeah. going for the green light my whole life, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. And, yeah. you know, history, even, even I would imagine when you were coming up is kind of a counter thing to do. I mean, it's not exactly trending. But no, it'll give you it'll give you you know great skill set for almost anything else or context. Yeah, and I, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada, which is a government town. It's the the capital of uh, Canada, so there's a lot of jobs for anybody who has an arts degree here. Um, if you want to join the civil service, I knew it was a safe thing to do, even though I had no intention of becoming a civil servant. I knew that I at least I could do that if everything else right. failed with my right. history degree. <laughs> but you're right. Even at that time, so we're talking like late nineties when I did that, uh, history was not, yeah, it didn't seem to be, cool? yeah, there was a lot of sociology, psychology, just talking about my circle of friends, uh, po political science. Sure. Um, but history, almost no one went into it. It was a small department. And, um, and today I imagine that it's even worse off because it is. Yeah. It, it, it just feels almost like you're, ah, I, yeah. I, I, it you're doesn't like, seem somehow yeah. anachronistic or something. Right. It, it, it's it, kind of Maine, ironic that history yeah. would feel anachronistic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, in Maine, you know, at the University of Maine, you can get almost a full scholarship through a PhD just because nobody does it. Nobody taps into the, the monies. So, right. you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Maybe that's a yeah. good segue. I haven't introduced it yet, but um, JF and I have decided to talk about a figure that pretty neglected. Um, I don't know of anywhere he's really being taught in America anyway. Um, and his name's Eric Vogelin. And Eric Vogelin described himself variously as a political or mystic philosopher, which right there should probably intrigue some of you. Um, how did how did you get turned on to Eric Vogelin? I was at uh, the University of Toronto, and I was taking a class in. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was a class in Thomas Aquinas. Um, hmm taught by a great, great professor whose name now escapes me. But anyways, uh, and I got to know another one of the students in that class and we went for coffee and he brought up Vogelin. He said, have you heard of Eric Vogelin? And I thought, I thought I'd heard of all the major, you know, I was surprised. Like, no, I haven't. <laughs> I was pretty proud of at the time. I thought that I knew quite a bit. I didn't. Um, and, and then he, ta he told me that Eric Vogelin was this, uh, I don't remember how he characterized them. He said something like he's an anti-Gnostic <laughs> or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought an anti-Gnostic. And I was, at the time I was just, I loved Gnosticism. I was, I was uh, reading uh, about the occult and, you know, Aleister Crowley. And uh, I was reading Hans Jonas and all the classic, you know, um, treatises on Gnosticism that have come out in the last hundred years or so getting into the Nag Hammadi texts and then taking classes in at, at the university. I took this one really fantastic class on Gnosticism. And so I saw Voglin as a kind of enemy. Oh, well, this guy, I'm not yeah, going right. to like him. I have to check him out though. <laughs> um, so, but it took me a long, long time to get to Voglin. And it wasn't until much later when I had already um, tempered my enthusiasm about Gnosticism, and that's kind of, I guess, putting it mildly, and uh, kind of uh, restored myself to some kind of more Platonic or Taoist kind of spiritual approach to things, I guess, that I finally read Vogelin. That was when I picked it up, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, he, he seems to have nailed something that a lot of other people have missed. Um, he picks up on a particular 
pedal tone that undergirds all modern philosophy that everybody seems to miss. But when you pick up on it, then you see it in everything from Descartes through Hume and Locke, Kant, Hegel, of course, Marx, Nietzsche. And you can see this. And it was, it was Vogelin who gave me a kind of key to understand what makes modern philosophy modern and how our unreflected, unreflective embrace of this idea that there is a modern philosophy and that it's somehow better than the ancient philosophy yeah. lines us to a lot of the affordances in ancient philosophy. So I don't know if that's a clear way of putting it, but to me, it was like a real lightning strike when I finally got to him. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't think I could have appreciated the way you put it when I got exposed to him, but, you know, in preparing for our talk, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this guy who, um, just, just how much he leans on, on Greek, Greek language. Yeah. And, and his, his, the thing that really, really strikes me is the way he imagines the human being or reality itself to be what he calls a metaxu, that, mm -hmm. that we are in an in-between and we're in yeah. between an imminent pole and a transcendent pole. And there's never, there's never, it's a humble thing with him. It's never, you're never going to get, get it all. No. You're always moving toward and living in this, this tension. And I feel like one of the things he does with that is he kind of, I don't know if the, because he, to my knowledge, he's not just going after Descartes or something. But he really is saying something. He's saying rather than having this thought and extension, it's all this between. And that's yeah. where we live and breathe and have our being. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. He is an analog philosopher. He's one uh, of the few analog philosophers because modern philosophy is fundamentally digital. Even when and I, I can explain what I mean by that in a moment, but even when modern philosophy tries to be analog, it's just basically like when you get a, a an app that's made to look like it's got a wooden paneling or something on the interface, it's like it's made to look analog, but it's still digital. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, how right. modern philosophy pulls <laughs> off an, mo analog because modern philosophy is fundamentally digital. What I mean by that is that modern philosophy works through... Um, uh, a binary system of either or a or b and that's the way that it breaks things down it um it it perceives reality as somehow containable in some fixed concept mm -hmm. or a set of fixed concepts and the concepts are naturally digital in the sense that a concept can't has no gradient it doesn't fade into anything that's closed on itself and the only it contains its own negation because it's like a switch, right? A mm -hmm. concept, like if I say a car, and then I can talk about in, lo in logic, I can say, well, a car can't be also a house because a car is not, you know what I mean? Like you, you have, and modern philosophy, modern thinking in general tends towards the digital. And, and, uh, and whereas ancient philosophy is fundamentally kind of analogical, um, an analog therefore if you were to see it as a technology it's it's about things phasing into one another it's all metaxu it's all in betweenness mm -hmm. it's that's why when you read plato you'll never get what you read what you get when you read a textbook on plato right it really boils it down to a set of when you read plato it's all so ambiguous and hard to figure out what he's getting at mm -hmm. it's not at all like platonism to read mm -hmm. Plato, reading Plato is like reading Shakespeare. It's really open to a lot of interpretations. And, <clears throat> and it's, asking, it's asking something more from the reader. It is. Uh, yeah, so I am reading Plato with a sense of, um, well, it's, it ranges from frustration to wonder, you know, and, and it's another big thing with Vogelin is about being open, an openness, an aletheia, to this thing and that there's an actual if you are if you have the right inner disposition towards it it will draw you 
towards. He's always talking about there's this thing that's pulling you towards in a platonic sense. And at the same time, there's something in you that's desiring. I, yeah. I find this just fascinating. And then the thing that's so wild about that, he says, and those two things can't be separated. Right. And even there, there's some kind of binary because my mind wants to go into all these, you know, theological categories of, you know, is God making that happen or am I doing anything? Or <laughs> Right, right. No, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's one of the few modern philosophers who aren't, as far as I know, who, who aren't um, completely um, uh, committed to a particular theological tract of thinking. Like, for example, Vogelin is very uh, positive in whenever he brings up Christianity as a general sense, Orthodox Christianity and what it's done in the world and what it represents. And yet, as far as I know, um, I don't see him as a Christian apologist. I don't see him as someone who's pushing Christianity. He's more of a Platonist. Um, but for Vogelin, uh, Vogelin, I think, would agree with Nietzsche's idea that Christianity is Platonism for the masses, but Vogelin would see that as a positive thing, mm -hmm. whereas um, Nietzsche saw it as a negative thing. So what Vogelin is constantly saying in his writing is, I think you said it really nicely, there is something outside of us, something transcendent. Philosophers call it transcendence, a transcendent reality that is intimately, personally connected to us and that we are uh, intensely personally connected to. And reality is a process by which we as individuals move towards this transcendent object. And that the it's not, uh, this is not just a, a metaphorical way of describing something that's actually boils down to like causal processes in nature. Mm -hmm. It's actually first and foremost, a kind of drama by which we are each called into reality and called to transcend that reality. It's first and foremost, a drama, not a blind set of causes and effects as it's as it's often conceived to be in, for example, modern science, you know? Yeah, he has this wild thing. I don't know, I can't quote his books, but I can remember reading this in the last few days where he talks about something like we're in a play, we're actors in a play, but we really don't know what the play is. Right. <laughs> it's just yeah. So, yeah, so beautiful. Well, and that's, yet we're yeah. obliged to we're obliged to act our parts, but we're not quite never can be quite so you know sure what they are yeah and that's that's one of the key things in, in weird studies we keep coming back to is the idea of an aesthetic universe right that the universe is not primarily let's say physical although it is physical i'm not denying that um but that the real motor of the real the real thing that drives the real is something that we we become most intimately aware of in, for example, when we look at art or when we, when we suddenly look at our own day, our own life as a kind of story, that that's what the stuff is made of, you know? Yeah. Um, that's what, sorry, that's the stuff that the world is made of. And I think in Vogelin, he really takes this insight, this, this way of looking at things, which is fundamental, it's, it's central in Plato. In Plato, it comes before the theory of forms. The theory mm -hmm. of forms is just part of that. It's just mm -hmm. a way to make that make sense. Um, he sees it coming through Plato and then uh, through the Neoplatonists into Christianity. And he sees that as a, the proper way of approaching a human life, of living a human life and of approaching any investigation of the real. Whereas what we have today for Vogelin, modern philosophy, modern science, understood as a kind of metaphysical position uh, in modern politics. He's very, he's a political philosopher first and mm -hmm. foremost. What he sees there is a, is, an, is a kind of heresy, a revolt against that way of living and seeing that Plato uh, kind of channeled into Western civilization. Yeah, it's striking that he, 
I, I, it, the way he talks about, it gives the primacy to the mythic symbolic. That yeah. He's saying that there's no way you could ever come up with a conceptual, with a concept that is, 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 um, that speaks as much to the truth as a symbol. Right. So he's never going to jettison symbols in favor of concepts. No. Um, and it's just amazing that he's, you know, he's a political philosopher. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the implication, and this is what makes Vogelin so, I think, one of the reasons maybe we don't hear about him too often. He's, it's such, his critique of modern Western society is so profoundly radical that I can't think of a single political camp on offer right now that would be able to embrace him without having to uh, call its own basic assumptions into question. I think that's right. Although I'm I, not, yeah, yeah. Don't you get the sense though right now though, it's, it's the it's certain elements on the right that try to claim him or he's often denigrated as somebody on the right. And I, and I say that because he is, so, he is such a Platonist where there is a good, a true, and the beautiful. He's not a sophist. He's not your truth and my truth and everybody else's truth. Um, yeah. Do you think that's fair? I, I think it is fair. Um, but I can't imagine how you could read Vogelin and derive from that a set of political positions that would align with what is called the right today. Yeah. I just don't believe that's the case. Uh, in fact, the way I read Vogelin, it's the, it's the, it's the strongest argument for, for democracy I could come, I could think of. He basically says that we have intimate, immediate access to reality, each of us, and that we each play a central role in that unfolding drama. Well, what sort of political system uh, recognizes that it's going to have to ha be some kind of participatory system mm -hmm. whereby, but again, we're think finding ourselves in this middle ground between left and right, because I was going to say where each person can find their way of living out that, that cosmic drama, that, that whatever it is, and it doesn't need to look like cosmic drama. It could look as simple as, you know, doing your thing in the world, you know, but, uh, but at the same time, you need to provide the conditions for people to do that. So to me, the, the left and right thing has always been a problem. I just don't see how, first of all, how one could even be conceived of without the other and how putting them in that binary opposition is ever going to amount to anything. I, I understand that there are fundamentally conservatively, there are people who are of a conservative temperament by nature and people who are of a, of a uh, liberal, I guess, or, or progressive temperament by nature. I tend to be a person who's very progressive instinctively. I tend to, um, but it seems that, I don't know, it just seems like Vogelin is trying to cut a line between them. I'm not surprised that people are characterizing him as, characterizing him as a right-wing sort of thinker um, because his thinking is goes so much against some of the central tenets of of progressive thought today, but I think you could find a very strong critique of the contemporary right in his thinking as well. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I yeah. think in a way he's he's kind of a corrective to a lot of the excesses of right wokeism or cancel culture or things like that. There's um there's a college in the states I don't know if you know of it, but it's it's thought to be one of the most conservative colleges in America called Hillsdale College. I think it's in Michigan. I don't, and I'm not aware of it. Vogelin enjoys a certain something there. Um, and, you know, one of the, I, I watched some videos about Vogelin from professors there. And they said that back in the 70s, he, he was really sort of the, the cause celeb amongst some right-wing thinkers. And they all said, don't imminentize the eschaton. Oh, yeah. I mean, William, <laughs> is it Buckley? Um, yes, yes. Uh, Buckley. Kept, yeah, Buckley's quoted that. And yes, yes. <laughs> we, 
we have to recognize that his his legacy has been on the right. I'm I was talking from my my own interpretation of Voglin. Oh, no, I understood you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's just it's just strange how I was able to because I was rereading a lot of Vogelin the last few days and I kind of forgot all about this. Yeah, the, the, I never this, even uh, knew about it until the other day. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny getting kind of more in weird studies. You know, I am. Um, I'm, I'm sort of in the same wheelhouse as you and like I know a lot of people who are part of this. Um, uh, this renaissance of psychedelic therapy and all right. that stuff. You know, and some of those folks, I would like to say, don't immunitize the eschaton to. Don't? You know, they don't immunitize they don't, it? Don't, because yeah. they're doing, you know, I, I kind of have, I wish Vogelin didn't use the term Gnostic sometimes. Yes. But there is that kind of, you know, it's the same enthusiasm we had with Leary and company that these substances are going to somehow they're going to be the last word in psychology, psychotherapy. Yeah. What the human being is ultimately that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's human nature to grab onto something and, and to kind of uh, turn it into um, a transcendental, a transcendent object that's going to, you know, some kind of a panacea or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, but um, uh, yeah. It, 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 at the same time, I think Vogelin, if he's a corrective to anything, he's exactly that. He's he's calling us to remember that the transcendent object is, I would say, at one and the same time, one and impossible to translate into a particular set of phenomena or a particular idea. Therefore, I think that Vogelin's vision calls us to a kind of pluralism, which we really haven't seen uh, uh, in modern thought. Like we haven't been, we've, of course we've seen pluralism, but we haven't been able to think the transcendent and to understand that as uh, favorable to an idea of plural, a pluralism, an idea that there be many paths, many that's faiths, right. many yeah. ways of living. And that's where I think Vogelin's idea of the transcendent is maybe what the left needs to restore itself to a vision of the transcendent, because that's what it's rejected. Because it's, it's the, the left is very rightly afraid of spiritual answers to problems. Mm -hmm. right? Um, for good reason, mm -hmm. but it just seems like uh, maybe we need some some way back to, you know, it's it's too much to give Vogelin and Jung and other great thinkers to give them to the right. It just it's not it's not going to help. I think we no, should find our own way of of getting to these thinkers and, and using their thought. But you know, the thing that's striking that you said this, I haven't thought of. You know, he is not a cheap perennial philosophy he's not no. a, he's not all roads lead to the same place and therefore why can't we get along no what he's saying is you know what really is striking to me is he's saying if you if you you know he even calls it something of a conversion if you if you go through some sort of change where now you're oriented towards the good the true the beautiful that that actually brings you into some kind of order. But yeah. at the same time, he's saying, it's also orienting you towards mystery. And I think yes. that a thinker that can combine those two ideas, you know, that's stunning. Exactly. But in a sense, that's kind of um, orthodox theology in a nutshell, right? So so he he's not, uh, he's, He's not claiming like Hegel or Nietzsche to, to have come up with this new system. His claim is that he is teaching and reminding us of the old tradition that existed in ancient Greece, that exi existed perhaps in Egypt, and then eventually that existed within, the, the, uh, within Christendom, let's say, in Europe. And um, 
you know, what he says is, this is a nice line here. Yeah, this is from uh, Science, Politics, and Gnosticism. He writes, he's writing about he Heidegger, uh, whom he doesn't like. <laughs> <laughs> He says, he writes, Heidegger's speculation occupies a significant place in the history of Western Gnosticism. So he's characterizing Heidegger as one more of these Gnostics. And by the way, I'll agree with you that his use of the word Gnosticism is not always, we have to understand he's using it technically to mean a specific way of thinking that mm. begins in the late Roman Empire. But I don't think that I don't think it characterizes all the various schools that have been called Gnostics. So it's probably not a useful term anymore. But anyways. He yeah. writes, Heidegger's speculation occupies a significant place in the history of Western Gnosticism. The construct of the closed process of being, the shutting off of imminent from world transcendent being, the refusal to acknowledge the experience of philia, eros, pistis, which means faith, and elpis, or hope, which were described and named by the Hellene philosophers as the ontic events wherein the soul participates in transcendent being and allows itself to be ordered by it. So I'm not going to finish this long run on sentence, but what he means is that Heidegger's philosophy is a rejection of this ancient idea that through love, hope, faith, and philia, I guess you could say maybe charity, or, or maybe we could replace it with another Greek word like, um, uh, what's that word? There's eros, philia, and... Agape. Agape. Um, his, he, Heidegger is rejecting this ancient idea that those affects are what put us in touch with or allow us to participate in a transcendent being. And in participating in that transcendence, we allow ourselves to be ordered by it. Yes. In other words, truth, goodness, and beauty for Vogelin exist, but they are not objects in the human mind like in kant they're not mm -hmm. structural components of a human way of looking at the world they are part of the given and there's no way of interpreting that given except through some conception of the divine so vogland says basically that in order to have a healthy polity you'll need to have some conception of the divine and in that sense he agrees with jung who thought we need an idea of god if we're going to function on this planet, we're not going to destroy ourselves. Yeah. So, so, but of course it's not God in the way that people have come to understand. It's not uh, uh, a God, a, a Christian or Jewish God or a this or that God. It's not God as a being, but God as the ground of being ground as a God, as a kind of source of reality, which includes meaning purpose yeah value love yeah. those things have to come from reality they can't just be uh, uh beaming out of our own consciousness and non-existent if we disappear you know right right so that's that's the idea and he has this wonderful way of talking about how you can be how certain individuals or a certain generation i don't know can be oriented towards the transcendent in that open way, in the mystery, living that experience, but then how those, those things can become calcified as concepts in the next generation. How, yeah. so, so how the very same word, if you will, can be a symbol that opens and then become very quickly a sign a sign yeah right to use like that's that's the way i'd put it in reclaiming art like a symbol is basically a little slice of reality that you allow to exist on its own without without trying to pin it down to one thing or the other symbols are profoundly ambiguous mm -hmm. if i show you a painting of a house in a field i'm not also telling you what that means but the fact that i've chosen to show you this painting the fact that this painting was conceived in this way tells you that there is some kind of meaning there is some kind of synchronistic meaning why this house and that field with that sky all works together and so that's 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 symbolism symbolism is uh 
uh, things revealed with a, a kind of multiplicity of possible meanings. Mm -hmm. And then we, what we tend to do is we tend to turn symbols. They tend to congeal, congeal and calcify into signs. Oh, the house in the field. Well, to, uh, I guess, to a certain type of critic would, well, all that landscape paint, landscape painting is a, uh, a kind of way of consolidating and reinforcing private property or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Like that there's sure. nothing more to it than that. <laughs> so, so that type of reducing symbols to signs is what Vogelin is constantly kind of uh, uh, warning us against, right? And it yeah. happens within within religious communities. Just look at look at what happened with Christianity. You know, look at what happens with any religion. Mm -hmm. It calcifies and needs to either renew itself, or then it transforms its, into its opposite, or it just disappears. Mm -hmm. So every generation, and I would say, I think Vogelin does say this: every individual, every person needs to renew that connection mm -hmm. with the symbol. And that really does speak to um, to Eastern Orthodoxy, where the I believe the word orthodox to them means right worship. Yeah. It's yeah. not right, it's not right thinking, it's right worship, right, right disposition. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's how they see it. And um, not to say that there's been no calcification within the orthodox world e either, but I think I I find it very inspiring to read some of the more mystical writings of the Eastern Church because they seem to have retained this fundamental platonic connection to mystery and the unknowable. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be really central in their way of, of looking at things. And in that sense, Eastern Orthodoxy would exist uh, in a, like it's, it's sharing a wavelength with things like, uh, like Sufism or Taoism, a lot of the mystical traditions of the East, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we switch gears a little bit and talk about weird studies, or as you guys say, the weird, W-Y-R-D, does the weird occupy a kind of transcendent pole in this time for a lot of people with the... Mm. With I the decline of institutional religion? Yeah, well, I think one of the reasons why the po the podcast works, and we have people from all kinds of backgrounds um, who listen to the show. We have a Discord, and it's really kind of a lively place with a lot of different people there. Uh, we get lots of emails, and it's surprise. It's kind of astounding to see the range of <laughs> uh, philosophical kind of uh, positions or religious backgrounds, or you know. Um, I can't imagine that you dead. guys are just having a blast. Oh yeah, we're having a blast <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we always look forward to recording and we're really enjoying the fact that people dig what we do. I mean, it's just the best thing you could hope for, right? But um, people must be coming at you from like so many angles. Yes, oh yeah, and that's, yeah. And that can get, it can get a little crazy because then you're thinking, well, how do we find a language that accommodates all these different ways of seeing? And we can't. All we can do is speak no. from our hearts and our yeah, own minds. Right. Don't you guys and, stop being yourselves? That's for damn. Right. <laughs> yeah, because it can get it can get weird sometimes <laughs> to use the the word. Um, but to answer your question, I think the weird is a provisional, modern, contemporary way of talking about the transcendent. That's what I think. I think the weird has gained prominence in our culture as the modern project has shown its limitations. So the weird for me is just the mood that waits for you just outside the perimeter of what we've been able to establish is, is, is true and right for all time. There are, there's a lot that we know as moderns. We know like modern science has revealed things to us. Um, but the, what, one of the things that's revealed, I think, and it's, it's baked into the very concept of science is that everything is falsifiable. Every theory is falsifiable. There's always the possibility 
that some revelation will come that will completely overturn what we thought was true. Yeah. And to live in that space is to live in proximity to something that we call the weird. But sometimes we call it also mystery. But the minute you switch from the word weird to mystery, <laughs> you're suddenly opening, the opening up a possibility that the weird is not just weirdness, like Lovecraftian horror waiting, like nonsense, but that, mis that, that the weird might disclose something to us, might have something to do with us as, pe as persons, mm -hmm. and that there is a kind of religious dimension to that. And Phil, Phil is a Buddhist and I'm, I'm a Catholic. We both have our ways of interpreting what that mystery is, but we, uh, we like to oscillate between these two ways of seeing, a kind of way, that, a way of seeing that's rooted in the weird without trying to um, explain it, and a more, I guess, uh, a more religious approach, which is to embrace the weird as itself a component of some grant, some greater or more radical mystery that might actually transform things, uh, that might actually involve us personally in some kind of cosmic or transcendent drama of some sort. Um, we're just open to that. We're not pushing any particular view, but we're just open to that. And you like to explore that possibility. No, and, and listening to you guys, so I'm a bit of a Philistine when it comes to art. So I weave in and out of the show. You know, sometimes you guys are like, <laughs> you get a little esoteric about the art, the music and stuff for me. Right. But what, what I've noticed is, and, and, and this is really quite unusual, is sometimes it feels like the weird is having its way with you. The two of them. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a certain domain within the weird, I don't know how to even talk about it, that if you try to bring that element of ordering or even maybe mystery to it, it just defies it. It just oh, like, yeah. oh, oh, you're going to try to do that? Well, let me just show you something, you know. And then you start seeing these elements of the absurd show up, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, amazing. Um, yeah often in the midst of this like really serious inquiry too. Um, so there's something in there that's like tricksterish that I don't, yeah, I don't associate that with even, you know, I'm sure it's probably elements are in, you know, you have the fools of Christ and orthodoxy and something comparable, Mullinas Rudin and Sufism and all that, but there's something about the weird that's a little more. Well, the weird's not just the angels; it's the angels and the demons, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, if you were to look at the weird from a, a traditional Orthodox perspective, uh, you might say something like, "The weird is the supernatural," and then, of course, that's just picking a frame for it. But the the fact you're right. The fact is that. Um, I'm convinced that uh, really diving into those regions of reality is as likely to generate horror and trepidation and, and confusion as it is to generate kind of salvific bliss, right? <laughs> like, like mm -hmm. uh, it's it's an ambiguous, a fundamentally tricksterish, ambiguous world. The weird and I mean, we get that, we see that all the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how, first of all, how many emails we get reporting synchronicities lift, linked to the show. Now, I don't know if that's just because there's enough people listening to it and they know all these people know we're interested in synchronicities that mm -hmm. we're more likely to hear about the synchronicities surrounding our show, but some of them are very strange. And also the, what, what's really strange for us is because we don't we don't plan shows ahead of time. We pick the next topic, and do you like pick the next topic like the the previous week, or do you have seven topics laid out? No, no. We usually pick the topic. Uh, well, sometimes depends. If we have a longer book, then we'll give ourselves a little more time. But that doesn't mean we know all the episodes leading up to that. So mm -hmm. we're basically just picking a topic. As once we record something, we go, okay, what do we do next? And then we'll come up with something. And things are, and a lot of them are are 
topics we've had on, on lists for a while and we've been talking about doing is this time, let's do that now. But then when we think back on what we did, there are all these connections and sometimes we'll pick like one book and then one film and no thought was put into linking those together. But when we get to talking about them, we're no, we notice that they're completely connected. Now, I know that in some ways, because we, we're both we're the same people talking about different things, so we tend to bring the same baggage to them. That's true. But some of those connections have been so strange, just the way that the show seems to have a mind of its own. It's mm -hmm. something that we constantly talk about, that there's Phil and there's me, and then there's Weird Studies, and Weird Studies has its own and so that's why it's really hard when people say like, I'd love to be a guest on your show. We don't really pick our guests. We don't really know what we're going to be talking about next. We're kind of just following this transcendent object. That is the show that transcends both of us mm. and it dictates what it wants next. And it really does feel that way. So it's, it's, ever, it's really strange. Have you ever gotten frightened? I've gotten frightened um in my yes uh or, well uh, yeah a couple of times um once this happened in i guess it was november or maybe early december of 2019 phil had a dream about a virus oh yeah <laughs> yeah did you hear that one? Oh yeah so, so <laughs> that was he had just a, unreal yeah. That dream really freaked me out when he described it. So it wasn't the synchronicity. It was just the way he, but I felt like he was describing something that was actually on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I hadn't even heard of, of COVID. But his dream for your listeners, he dreamt that he entered his uh, dining room. It was somebody else's. It was like a suburban dining room, nondescript, really kind of classic or typical decor. And hovering over the dinner table was a gigantic virus. And it was just throbbing and had all these uh, spikes and their tentacles coming out. And it's as he's watching it, it's suddenly it's it's tendrils reach out and just infect the furniture around it, the walls, his body. And suddenly he realized that it was infecting the whole world. So this happened like two months before. That was basically a month before it really started in china now i'm losing all the chronology but it was before it was in our on our radar here anyway yeah. um and as he was describing it i thought well this is azathoth i thought he had a dream of azathoth i don't know if you're familiar with oh, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. azathoth is the 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 crawling chaos at the center of the universe right in, in lovecraft's um fiction so we talked about it on the show then we exchanged some emails uh, about it, which we published on, on, uh, on our Patreon site. And I just knew that whole time that there was something real happening, that we were not just, yeah, it was his dream, but it felt to me like an event. It was almost like I was having the dream while he was describing it. Mm -hmm. And then I, from then on, I kind of knew that there was a pandemic coming. So when COVID started, I'm like, this is the dream. This is what's happening. We, we saw this. And, and you only mentioned me out. it to the audience after the pandemic started, right? No, we're on record. It's all before it started. It was all before? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can look back and you can see it happen. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, yeah, so that was spooky. And also sometimes I scare myself. I remember at the end of the Stalker episodes, we did two episodes on Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky's film Stalker. And at the end of the second one, I was describing, I was just, I was comparing the setting of Stalker, which is this kind of desolate zone where some event has made, uh, some event has transformed and made unlivable, right? Uninhabitable to people. And, and I was comparing it to, uh, the Chernobyl disaster site. And I was suddenly got this ridiculous, nostalgic, romantic feeling for these images of a desolate earth with no one left. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that I think, I think that I, 
I felt at that moment, I felt that uh, the, the main drive of contemporary thought of what the collective unconscious wants now, not the collective unconscious, but collective consciousness well, is we want to disappear. I had a feeling that humans right now are just actively working towards their own disappearance. Yeah. And it felt very real and very scary to me. Did you talk about that on the show? We did. So if you look at Stalker Part 2, the last third, I would say, probably heads in that territory. Um, and we end on that note. Um, and that's, that, that frightened me because I don't want us to be a nihilistic species. <laughs> but no. sometimes I feel that we are. Um, and that we have made a decision. We've made a decision about what humans are and what they mean and what they're worth. And I, I think we're I think that's you know, so yeah. dead on. We've made some very dangerous decisions about who we are, and we we act as though we don't belong here or something. Yeah, that the Earth would be better without us. That we were, you know, it's almost like buys into this sort of alien thing that we were yeah. just sort of deposited here and we're waiting to be taken away, but we're not. We're not part of it. We're. We're well, the, the idea of alienation is central to Gnosticism, right? Right. Um, so some forms of Gnosticism, let's say, Sethian Gnosticism, and then some of the ancient forms was certainly in Hans Jonas's understanding of Gnosticism, which Vogelin was relying on when he wrote um, uh, this, this sense of living in a world that where we don't belong, that we belong mm -hmm. elsewhere, um, and that uh, that our salvation lies in leaving, you know, disappearing. Right, right, Spawning. getting the hell out of here. Yeah, getting yeah. the hell out of here uh, <laughs> is kind of central to, to, to Gnosticism and therefore, according to Vogelin, to modern thought in total. Like it's just rooted in this rejection of the world as it is in favor of an imaginary world and failing that in favor of a kind of nothingness. Uh, yeah, and just saw this. well, we can, and just now with the transhumanism and the going to Mars and all that, you know, that this is yeah. some kind of salvation to be, to be uploaded into a cloud. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that some people, that to me is one of the weirdest ones, the, this idea of mind uploading. Oh yeah. You could, yeah. It, to me, it's just the same logic um, that you see in reports about, you know, these aren't even true, I don't think, but reports, anthropo anthropologists or like, um, tr you know, explorers in the late 19th, early 20th, early 20th centuries said that they would meet indigenous cultures that believe that if you took their photograph, you would capture their soul. I'm sure right. there's some truth to that right. because there's, there, I think it's kind of true in a way, Yeah, but it's not... <laughs> To me, there's no difference between taking a photo of someone and scanning their brain. One is just a higher resolution. It's more granular, but it's mm -hmm. just as much of a facsimile. And if it's not you, I mean, you're, you don't believe right. when you look at a picture of yourself, you don't believe you're in the picture. And there's no interiority at all. It's no, like, it just seems like, like we've forgotten it, that, the, that there is, even is such a thing. Yeah. yeah. It's like you know a 3, do 3D that's, scan. That's related. That's really good. And probably, I would imagine, it has something to do with uh, your fascination with Ligotti. Oh, when yeah. You, you really, when you guys start delineating that, that part of the weird that is um, uncanny or indifferent to us, maybe idly idly curious the the whole uh the Fortean thing of that we're just cattle or something right that that sense of i'm being watched by something that doesn't care about me and by something that doesn't fit into any of the religious or metaphysical systems of this earth you guys you guys get that yeah. really good yeah, yeah thanks yeah, yeah. It's, it's my it's one of my favorite affects is that feeling of cosmic horror i'm and i don't know what it is about it that that i find so moving but i do find it moving that type of fear um 
Well, Ligotti yeah. is oddly moving. He's oddly yeah. beautiful in a lot of those stories. Yeah, I would say almost um, reverent of something, reverential. Yeah. Or, or Like there's something, um, for lack of a better word, there's something religious in his writing that I really like. There's something sacral, something that's recognizing uh, a reality that is so much bigger. Yeah. And it's not so much that I think in Ligotti that this, this thing doesn't care about us. Like in Lovecraft, it's not that it's indifferent because it's too big. Like Lovecraft's Cthulhu is like the size of a modern town. So of course he doesn't care about us. We're like insects to it. But that's not what's going on in Ligotti. In Ligotti, there's a deep personal connection between the horror and the narrator, let's say, or the protagonist. They're, yeah. they're involved. They're one and the same. Often they phase into one another. Yeah, and this it's it's an exploration of melancholy and that I find. Landscape. There's always a landscape, right? Yeah. A landscape, a desolate landscape, and but I just I just love it. I don't. Um, I find it as 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 frightening as I find it sometimes, and as disturbing and troubling as I as I find it. I also find it strangely moving and inspiring, Ligotti. Uh, I'm talking about his fiction, not his nonfiction. Well, yeah, conspiracy against the human race might, I consider that to be actually not in any, you know, burn the book kind of way, but I think that's a dangerous book. In the hands of the yeah. wrong reader, that's, that's a dangerous book. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It is a dangerous book. Yeah. And Russ Cole in, in True Detective is the right. embodiment of that book. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> So that would be a good show. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I um I have nothing but respect for Ligotti. Um at the same time. And and you know what, to be honest, I think that I don't think um he might not agree. And of course it's I don't think there's much of a difference really between conspiracy against the human race, his nonfiction screed against existence and the fiction if you choose to read conspiracy as though it were you know the writings of a fictional protagonist yeah he did call he did subtitle it a uh -huh. contrivance of horror so if yeah. you read it that way uh -huh. that doesn't mean it's any less dangerous because he's he's making an argument yeah. um but uh i think we should see it it's his attempt i think to generate the type of terror that he wants us to feel. Mm -hmm. And, um, but again, I can't help but see that terror as a step, a movement towards something that's not that terror. That's well, that's, that's, that's really of, fascinating. Yeah. You say that because there's, you know, he does, he doesn't spend a lot of time with it in the book, but he goes off into this little, little, it's not very long at all. He goes off in this discussion of nihilism in relation to Christian mysticism. Yeah. And, you know, it really makes me, um, it, I think, I don't know, maybe it was Zizek or Peter Rollins or somebody, and they're talking about the nihilistic core of Christianity. Yeah, that, Zizek talks about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the and word so, is apophatic, right? Yeah, apophatic very, mysticism. That's right, it's very apophatic. So you could almost read Ligotti in a way that there still is that, thing pulling but and but but it's actually pulling you through this sort of morass of of now or there's some sort of uh threshold there's some sort of occult threshold you're being pulled across the threshold yeah i, I don't know if the story's name is the short story if you read the short story called candy by it's, Ligotti yeah the, i don't remember the that one. grotesco it's oh. um might not be called candy. It's about a little boy who wanders off into this other neighborhood. Purity. Purity. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite the story. Yeah. But doesn't it have that element of like you're crossing the threshold and you're going to encounter the guardians of the threshold? And it's almost, you know, it's got that weird Stephen Kingy thing of through the eyes of a child mm -hmm. um, 
it's just amazing. Oh, it's it's one of my favorites. I actually tried to option that story. Really? Because um, I rec- I tried to get a film student I had once. I wasn't yeah. teaching film to do it. I was like, this is the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, I think it would make a great kind of um, Spielberg esque. <laughs> yeah um coming of age tale uh <laughs> but the reason i couldn't i didn't have enough money to i couldn't afford it um at the time but uh yeah pu- purity is it, it's funny because it, it ties into everything we've been discussing because purity is the story of a boy whose father is this basically a mad scientist and the father drags his family from town to town they live in cheap rental houses and the father sets up his laboratory in the basement and is up to his weird experiments and then eventually they have to move on to some other place and uh, the father has this kind of principled uh, re- uh, uh, hatred of home ownership or any type of ownership everything's on rent everything's rental this is a rental yeah, the is rented. Yeah. yeah the furniture is rented your body's rented um <laughs> I, it's reminding me of another passage from Ligotti where he's like, we live in a universe that seems like it was concocted in a cheap rented tub or something like that. <laughs> like uh, it's from a uh, spectral link anyways. So this, this family moves around, they're kind of nomadic and this boy is just left to his own devices. His mother is just really distant and, and doesn't um, pay any attention t- to him Uh and he goes wandering off and he makes a friend. Uh, he meets this woman who lives in a kind of dilapidated house and they become friends. But there's also this child murderer wandering around in the story. But, but the point is this, I want to go back to the, the father is obsessed with purity and his goal is to clean, to, to rid us, to exercise us of our impurities, which in the story manifests as a kind of sludge that he can actually extract from people. And uh, the impurities are, I'm trying to remember what they are. There's religion, nation. Um, yeah, I can't remember what the third, family? No. Probably family's the, for the last one at the end. It's family. That's the, the reveal at the end. Um, I can't remember. Religion, nation. What would be the other one? We could look it up. But anyways, and, um, and it's, it's kind of strangely... I don't know. To me, it kind of connects with Vogelin. It's, it's, he's, <laughs> his father is obsessed with ridding us of all the idols, all the, the symbols we've mistaken for signs. Right, that's to restore right. us to an idea of what, what the purity is talking about is a kind of dark unknowing, an unknowing of everything, an undoing of all of our, uh, our attempts and our, our delusions of having a grasp on things. Yeah, the arrogance and, of that. The, yeah, the arrogance of that, and and so that in, that's the that's the key ingredient for Ligotti for me. It's that he always ends up putting me in a place of kind of humility, a kind of falling on your knees in front of something vast and dark. And and if you read a lot of the apophatic mystics in the Christian tradition, their language is very Ligottian. The mm-hmm. way they describe God as an abyss. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's it's not what you learned in Sunday school. You know, oh, yeah. and, it and it's a, John of the Cross saying God's God's absence is his mode of presence. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And 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 that that whole tradition is central to how the uh, at least the more esoteric component of Christianity developed over time. So. Um, so Ligotti, who was raised Catholic and was actually quite a devout until the age of, I think, until he was a teenager, where he suddenly had a, an athe- a crisis of atheism so terrible that he fell into a depression from which he never emerged. Uh, I think that he, he's a participant in that tradition, mm-hmm. um, even though he completely rejects the religion. Um, which is yeah. interesting because some of the lives of the saints, they say that these people, these, these men and women would go into these barren regions for decades. Yeah. They would just wander into a, in a wasteland, 
keeping faith, but in a wasteland. Yeah. And one of my favorite sayings of the desert fathers is uh, from Isaac. It was not Isaac. Uh, now I'm forgetting his name. Yeah, Isaac of Syria, I think. He said something like, and I can paraphrasing, but he says, what is a, mer a merciful heart? What is a merciful heart? He says, a merciful heart is a heart that burns with love for all of God's creatures, for humans, for animals, for demons, for everything. So it, when the mystic says, you're not a, you don't have a merciful heart until you're burning with love for demons. <laughs> yeah, right? um, that's a pretty right. Lagardian kind of thing to say. It is. Like, likewise, um, Teresa of Vizieux, who's one of the great modern saints, well, the nuns in her convent had to, they tried to edit her writings at the end of her life because the last phase of her life was just this abyss of atheism where she was describing God as a kind of total absence where but it's a mistake to think that that's the same type of atheism as what Richard Dawkins espouses. Right. It's not the same type of atheism. It's, it's, yeah, it's not a materialist reductionism. Exactly. And yeah. that's important. Um, yeah. Like the type of atheism I sense in Albert Camus, I find Camus really inspiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, there are forms of atheism that recognize the weird and the mystery and the, and the strangeness of it all. And well, it was really so telling that, he, that before he got the Nobel Prize, he prayed in the room Simone Weil died in. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I didn't know about that. I know that he was a big fan of Simone Weil. Like, I, I, I know that he respected her. Um, and there are hints that towards the end of his life, Camus was moving back towards some kind of more religious outlook, but never made it there but, but i think we're in this territory where i mean it's a little ways from Bogolin, but it's really something about faith is is less about hope uh hope for things unseen i guess as an unflinching willingness to face the real yeah and a trust that what we're offered is the real right and here here this is super important this is super important, I think, because I think that the way that I characterize the last 500 years of philosophy, and by philosophy, I just mean the way people think, is with the term, an ethos of suspicion. I think with Descartes, we start to hold the world suspect. The world has to prove itself that it is what it seems to be, right? That's what Descartes brings into the story. And this just gets more and more entrenched until you finally reach the so-called, you know, uh, the so-called masters of suspicion, Nietzsche, uh, Marx, uh, and Freud, who are thinkers who present us with a system which tells us, first and foremost, everything you see and experience, what is called, what people have seen as what is given. What, what, what seems to be given is actually a complete illusion. And to get to reality, you have to overturn you have, to, you have to destroy the given and get to the central insight. Will to power or death drive, right? Or um, in the case of Marx, well, dialectical materialism, the class struggle. Those are the prime, those are the real uh, powers behind things. And the way things look to us, for example, your love for your children, mm -hmm. your your sense of belonging in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. your, 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 your need to bring justice to the world, you know, your, your need to create art, to, to give to the poor, whatever it is. All those things are just functions of this underlying indifferent uh, process, class struggle, uh, will to power, uh, death drive or pleasure principle, depending on which side of for you prefer. Um, and I find that that move is what Vogelin is talking about when he talks about Gnosticism. Mm. We can forget about ancient Gnosticism. He's talking about that move, that's, that move, that total, almost fanatical embrace of an ethos of suspicion. Mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're asked to do now is to, I think, 
return somehow, find a way back to an ethos of trust. Because now we've come to the point where we're all suspicious, not just of the world, but of one another. It's this profound kind of like um, uh, pervasive, ambient sense of suspicion that's around us now. And it's a consequence of the last 150 years. How do we find our way back to an ethos of trust? Well, I think first and foremost, we need to find a way to trust that the world we're given is not just dancing molecules or the wave function or the will to power, but actually a kind kind of set, a kind of dramatic setting, just like Mm. Vogelin calls us, that we're living and that it's meant to be this way. Yeah. A car is not just reducible to its chemical, mechanical or atomic components. A car is a car. A tree is a tree. Mm-hmm. It's a tree in the same way as a tree in a novel is a tree. Like mm-hmm. it'd be absurd to insist that, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, give me a famous tree from a, from a, from a novel. Um, <laughs> well, not gonna be able now to I, that now. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to go to scripture. I want to, I want to stick with, oh, I don't know the, the tree in this Dostoevsky novel, there's a tree there. It'd be insisted. It'd be, it'd be absurd to insist that that tree is actually composed of like, these molecules and all that it's not it's in a novel right what is a novel it's an aesthetic universe right what if we live in an aesthetic universe what if the world is given to us in such a way that we can trust it then after that all the promise and the horror can still follow but at least it exists in a world that in which we belong it's almost like we're at home in the universe again but our home is a haunted house, you know, but yeah, you get both. Yeah. Right. But the desolate landscape is as much a part of the real and the whole as anything else. And we're not exactly to banish anything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It seems like some kind of that's I, I, so I, all this to say that I fully agree with you when you say that faith is first and foremost, being able to look at the real and to take it, to, to, to face it, and to somehow, uh, I would add to that, to somehow trust it, even if it's horrific, even if it's terrible. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that that's a probably a good place to end because it actually opens up about four different tributaries like you know what's real and what's conspiracy theory and or why oh god you know all that stuff it's really yeah well this has been everything i had hoped it would be so oh i'm glad to hear it no i thank Uh, you very much it was a great conversation if you want to you know do it again sometime i'd be more than happy oh yeah i've got ideas you stay online (laughs) i'll give you one or two okay all right good night everybody Thanks. Bye.